That was all made up on the spot. <laughs> like there was that wasn't in the script. They just had I, to figure out a way to have a turn to make, make everything make sense at the end. So yeah, they just kind of like, oh fuck, uh, um, uh, we got to make this make sense somehow. And, and I'm gonna talk about that too uh, in my final thought. Hello and welcome to Go with the Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. Because there is no other era of action movies. There's just this era of action. Anything before 1975 does not classify as an action movie. Anything post 20 or not 2010. We, we talked about this before. Anything after Mad Max Fury Road is it an action movie. <laughs> 1975, <laughs> basically like roughly around the time Star Wars came out to when Mad Max came out. That's the end of the action era. <laughs> <laughs> and this, oh, this week, one lives up to it too it was totally betamax quality <laughs> <laughs> this week we got i, th- I think it's gonna say it right at the beginning we got a stinker yeah we, we got a real a stinker. stinker on this one. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think either, any one of us is going to take the opposite <laughs> stance on that one <laughs> It, it was very much somehow a TV movie got worked into this. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> this is, of course, Deadly Bet, our Las Vegas entry for the greatest karate city, which originally premiered on October 31st, 1992. That 1992 year? Yeah, that throws you for a left hook. Because <laughs> this does not look like 1992. No, it does not. Now, no, all the shots of Vegas look like it's from like the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too. I'm like, is this like a, it looks like some kind of poor filming too. So it really looks like the seventies. Now this movie is next to impossible to be able to find. We could not find it on any existing streaming services. It is not available for purchase as a DVD on Amazon. You can find some copies on eBay, but luckily I mean, luckily, I, don't, I don't know if it was luckily. <laughs> we were able to find a trash can version on YouTube. <laughs> I don't think it's a trash can version. I think it's just the regular version. <laughs> and there lie. was a reason why we couldn't find it on all those services. <laughs> we searched long and hard at every garage sale and the state sale. <laughs> and finally, we found the VHS. <laughs> this was for sure a transfer of a VHS through someone recording their television. Like, how was the quality of the video that this was that we found? But no matter how bad this was, no matter how bad the quality was, I still think it was worthwhile because this is definitely one of those movies that it's so bad it's good because we're, we're about to rip this thing apart. This is about to get destroyed. <laughs> well, not just that. I will say this, all right? So about three quarters of the movie is just the fighting scene, the scenes in the matches. And they're actually pretty good scenes scenes in the matches you know with the with like the actual martial arts that's true the only thing that was kind of weird about it was that the main character isn't in 75 percent of them (laughs) (laughs) so it was just weird because most of the time he was just sitting in the audience watching two guys fight and so it was like (laughs) oh okay this is this is weird I we really don't have a dog in this fight. I can't wait to get to that scene. I can't wait to get to that scene where it's like it's a whole, it's like multiple. Never mind, never mind. We're gonna come back to it. I can't wait to get <laughs> no. to that scene. Yes. No. This is so great because they did not have an hour and a half worth of movie. They had about seventeen minutes worth of a movie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> same amount of the stuff to put in it. Let me go back yeah, to the so movie. Like the talking parts of the movie may not be great, but there's enough fights that you could almost just fast forward to it. <laughs> Watch it at 2x speed. You, you you got it. You'll be all right. <laughs> Back to the movie stats here. It is directed by Richard Munchkin. This dude is all about gambling. He is a professional blackjack player, appeared on a blackjack game show, wrote a book about gambling, hosts a radio show about gambling. He even worked in a casino. Oh, and he also wrote and directed over 20 movies, including Ring of Fire oh. and two other movies starring Dawn the Dragon Wilson. <laughs> Really? <laughs> it is written by Joseph Mary and Robert Tiffey. Now, Joseph Mary founded or co founded PM Entertainment, the production company behind this movie. He produced a ton of movies and then his company went out of business. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's about what you'd expect out of this movie. Was it after they did this movie? <laughs> deadly bet was a deadly bet. 
<laughs> it's gone. <laughs> the wiki also suggests that he owned a bunch of pizzerias in the Vegas area. So there's a lot of Las Vegas crossover here. Th- this movie's huh. just about Las Vegas, right? Like they're like, yeah. let's make a hometown movie. I'm going to come back to that. My final thoughts too about, about this movie in Vegas. Now, Robert Tippy made a bunch of direct to video stuff. The staff here, writing, director, producers, as if they found a collection of people in a parking lot on their smoke break before they had to go back in as a waiters at a restaurant where you sing. <laughs> what are those buffets? <laughs> Yeah. The Vegas buffets where they have like steak and eggs. and. <laughs> <laughs> it also made me think of that. Maybe these are the guys that got busted in casino. You know, that scene where he hits the dude with yes. a hand with a hammer. Like maybe it was uh-huh. those two guys. Yeah. Cause they thought they were the, they were <laughs> smooth cheaters and then they got caught. <laughs> Before we get started, we want to cover why we chose this movie to be in this season. And I think we chose it because it had two things. One, it was set in Las Vegas. We knew like, okay, we need a different city other than LA and New York, which is where a lot of these movies are based. And two, it had a big, what we thought was like, not necessarily a big name, but he was hyped as being a big name action star. In Canada. (laughs) Jeff Wincott was supposed to be a big deal as far as a big deal as, uh, in the marsh- 90s martial arts movie because he made a bunch of them. Believe it or not, 1996, Black Belt Magazine named him martial arts movie star of, his, uh, of the century <laughs> or one of martial arts movie stars of the century. Really so like, Jeff Wincott was no a respect. pretty big deal. <laughs> We felt like we had to do a Jeff Wincott movie. The only problem is none of us know any Jeff Wincott movie. So we saw one. It was set in Vegas. It seemed perfect for what we were doing. And, well, maybe it wasn't the best Jeff Wincott representation. (laughs) Or maybe it was. I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll talk about that. (laughs) The feeling that I get is... This was our one and only Jeff Wincott experience. This is all we got. <laughs> no, not necessarily. All right. So Jeff Wincott is a Toronto born actor, producer, and martial artist. He's best known for his Gemini award winning, not Gemini being a Canadian award. <laughs> so it's a Canadian Emmy. He won a Canadian daytime <laughs> Emmy for a lead role in a TV series, <laughs> Night Heat. So, but Night Heat was a pretty big deal because Night Heat was the first Canadian show ever to be broadcast in the States. It mm. also ran on CBS. Oh. It was the first one ever to do so. It ran from 85 to 89. And you know, and people thought, wow, here's this Jeff Wincott guy. It's going to be a big deal. And mind you, before he got the role on the on the show, he had done some stage acting. He had been in a Molson beer commercial. Mm. It's a pretty big deal, man. I mean, it's Molson. <laughs> He also had a small role in the horror movie Prom Night. It, that movie sounds so, so familiar. I, th- I think we've I, seen that. I think we watched it for Halloween one year. So he did two TV movies in the 90s, Universal Soldier 2 and Universal Soldier 3, guest starring Burt Reynolds and Gary Busey. <laughs> that was awesome. Hold and, on a second. There's Universal Soldier movies with Burt Reynolds in them? Yeah, what? And Gary Busey, TV movies, yes. <laughs> oh, TV movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even Thank still. God. I Even thought they were still, like real movies. I'm, I'm kind of in on that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, don't don't count them out now. We might get some Universal Soldier Burt Reynolds. So, <laughs> um, but I, I, I guess it was that experience that, that pushed him to go back into more dramatic roles. And believe it or not, since the 2000s, he's actually been in a few decent movies, better movies. Like he was in 2003 SWAT with Samuel L. Jackson. Mm. And he was in 2010's Unstoppable, which mm. uh, was a Denzel movie. Making better choices for his movie roles this decade, in the past two decades. I was just lo- looking up Prom Night, too. And I'll, actually, I don't think we've I don't seen think that. I don't think we've seen that, yeah. I want to see it now, though. <laughs> I've got Leslie yeah. Nielsen in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but feel that Jeff Wincott bamboozled us. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were like, well... It's Vegas, and we got to see, and Jeff Wincott seems like he's a big deal, so let's go with Deadly Bet. And then we couldn't find it, and they come to find out, like, oh, man, this, this is almost out of print, essentially. It's next to impossible to be able to find. But then you watch it, and it's like, the people taking this out of print have done the world a favor. <laughs> 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 they were like, we were trying to save you people, but you had to go and be digging for it. <laughs> now you got what you deserve. <laughs> 
in the end, though, I, I, I think we're going to come back around. As there are some highlights in this movie that were, I'm not going to go as far as enjoyable. Maybe tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to say right now, if you're listening to this podcast, this is the best version of Daily Bet that you're going to get is listening to us describe it instead of you <laughs> yeah, watching. Actually watching it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's one person out there that's insulted. Like, I thought that was a great movie. That person that uploaded it to YouTube. <laughs> the person yes. in the comments. <laughs> in the Thank comments you, of by YouTube. By the way. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so I, I just pictured them with like the big video camera that used to take the VHS tape tapes. <laughs> and he's like videoing his TV as the movie's playing on Betamax. I was say there's a person on there that commented like, oh my god, Jeff Wincott, he's this he's an amazing actor. This this is just like his highlight. This should be like a highlight reel for him. <laughs> So, guys, this was the highlight. <laughs> I'm sure Night Heat wasn't bad. I mean, it won a Gemini Award, or at least got nominated. <laughs> All right, well, let's go break this one down and give it the full go with the heat treatment. I think we should go halfway on this one. I don't think we should go full. <laughs> This movie opens classically and it sets the tone for what the rest of the movie is going to be because we open with a couple saying this is their last night and they're going to move to a it's a classic Vegas story that then he gambles away all of their money. She leaves him and then he stumbles around drunk for the next three or four days. Oh, sorry. This movie actually covers longer than that. The first 75% of the movie consists of one 24-hour period. <laughs> and then the last 25% is over like six months or some shit. <laughs> I don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And it starts out and he's talking to his... his uh, at first, I thought it was his dad, the lounge singer. <laughs> like, I thought this is their... Like, or maybe it was her dad. Ouch. You know? And, like, they're saying, like, all right, dad, we're moving to Colorado. And then, like, they stop by, they have to, he has to stop by his bookie first. And he's such a degenerate gambler throughout this entire first three quarters of the movie that not only does he bet all the money he has, he bets all the money he wins, and then he bets his wife (laughs) or girlfriend. Yeah, he bets his girlfriend within the first 10 minutes of the movie. You're like, wow, he's really likable. (laughs) Like, he was really committed for Colorado. Like, Like, here, you can have her. (laughs) <laughs> I got the guy in the USA pants, which by the way, I don't know if I'm taking the guy in the USA pants. I mean, I get it in the WWE sense. He should win, but like, if this thing ain't planned, I don't think it's going, I don't think it's going to go well for him. Oh, I know is that you better watch out for our roundhouse to the face. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> by the way, the girl is Isabel. The character, her, she's played by Charlene Tilton. She was in superhero movie in 08, Silence of the Hams in 94 with Dom <laughs> DeLuise and Billy Zane. Paranormal Calamity in 2010. So she seems to think she's funny. <laughs> <laughs> she's most notably played Lucy Ewing in 242 episodes of Dallas. Oh my God, that is her. It just dawned on she me also, when he was like he was saying her name that she's from Dallas. Yes, she was like a from she was like a little whore. 90, <laughs> from nineteen seventy eight to nineteen ninety, she played Lucy Ewing on Dallas, and then she rebooted the role, or I should say, reprised the role from twenty twelve to twenty fourteen when they rebooted Dallas for six episodes. She played Lucy again. Oh my god, um, I can't believe that's her. <laughs> my mind is blown yeah. right now. <laughs> So her first acting credit was an episode of Happy Days in 1976. Then she had a role in Freaky Friday as well. But lately, she has done Vengeance, a love story with Nick Cage in 2017. Whoa. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and that's one of those Nick Cage, I need money for my taxes movies. Set in Kazakhstan. <laughs> All the way through, this is such a classic Vegas story. We're in classic Vegas, so basically all the casinos that we see in this movie, they don't exist anymore. And in fact, the way Vegas is going is going to be nothing but whorehouses and pawn shops by 2022. So they yeah, None of them exist right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with you, John. Not only did I think that was going to be her dad, but I was like, they were playing the music in the background. And I'm thinking like, man, this lounge singer really sucks. I mean, he's really terrible. <laughs> and then they go up and talk to him. She's like, this is my brother. I'm like, Ew, sorry, bro. <laughs> also, they look nothing alike for being brother and sister. But, you know. Well, I was just confused because like I, I didn't hear a call of his brother. And like, I see him talking to him. And I'm like, what's with the old dude with the beard? 
Like, who the heck? And he goes to him a few times. And, like, every time he goes to him, it's like going to his dad. Like, Dad, I screwed up again. <laughs> of course, it being a classic Vegas story, before they can leave, Angelo's got to make one more bet. He can't leave. Just one more bet. Well, he has to go pay off his Oh, bookie. that's right. Yeah. They so got to pay him off. But then while he's there, he p- goes to his, his bookie, and his bookie's like, hey, you want some of this action that's going on over here? And Because, you know, there's always fights going on in Vegas. Apparently, and everywhere you go, there's just like... It's just bare knuckle fights everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> just kickboxing everywhere you go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No holds bar too. They like that one dude. Like, look, I'm pretty sure he got killed. Yeah, the I know. Where, like, he snapped his neck. Yeah, with the nunchucks. You're allowed to nunchuck fight in Vegas. <laughs> we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. <laughs> now this isn't his bookie. This is just the guy that puts on the fights, Rico, because his bookie is the other guy oh, yeah. with the sweet ponytail. It's a fake ponytail. <laughs> it's fake. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It's fake. It's not real. I'm disappointed by that, but it's not real. It's not a real ponytail. It's fake. No. And then instead of after he wins, yeah. instead of just leaving with the money and his girlfriend to go start his new life at a KOA campground in Colorado, <laughs> which is what it looks yeah. like when they get there. Yeah. The You're very confused by that. Okay. Yes. He decides I'm gonna go two to one just the last ten minutes. In a fight, which is a long time for a ten fight. Minutes, like, ten yeah. minutes, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. In boxing, that's nearly three rounds. Yeah. In UFC, that's two full rounds. Yeah, exactly. Like, and mind you, he is drinking the entire time we've seen him on screen. So he's pretty three sheets to the wind at this point. And he's got a little bit of a gut. Um, Rico, <laughs> mind you. <laughs> Rico, mind you. Looks like he's in very good shape. Small business owner. Sober. Like, <laughs> seems like a pretty good bet for him. <laughs> Also, right away, you notice that Rico really likes his girlfriend, Isabella. He's, like, making eyes at her. And she's kind of making eyes at him, too. Like, during the during the whole fight where they where he won the money, she was kind of, like, looking at him. And Angela's like, why are you looking at him? And it's like, because maybe he looks better than you. No. <laughs> he's going to treat you better, isn't he? Yeah. He's also not going to tell you to shut up in front of uh, other people. Yeah, and then he tells her to shut up. Yes. She's like, don't do this. It's a bad idea. He's like, you better just shut up. Then she walks away and he's like, oh, by the way, if I if I lose, you can, ha- you can have her too. Okay, uh, we haven't even left for Colorado yet and you're giving me away. <laughs> so, Greco lays a whooping on him and then takes his girl and peace. We're going home. Go and hit the hot tubs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love the fact that Isabella finds out. Yeah. Isabella finds out that she's been bet in the ring. And she's like all disappointed and she slaps Angelo and then she just goes with Rico. Hey, what else she gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Go home. Well, dude. So and, and mind you, no. Nope. So all right, and pretty quick, like in the next scene or two, we eventually we see Rico's house. And Rico's doing pretty good for himself, man. He's got a nice house in Henderson. <laughs> um like he's living right. He's treating her right. He's giving her money to get her hair did and stuff. <laughs> like, like I'm all for Rico. <laughs> Gotta tell you, I was for Rico too. That's why I was like, yeah, go home with him. And you, <laughs> yeah. they, keep, they keep setting up the scenes when she's over at his house. Okay, now this is gonna be the time where he's gonna force himself on her or he's gonna force her to do something. And it never comes. No, because he's like, no, no. you wanna go get your hair done? Just take my bodyguard with you. And she's like, why? Because I can't go by myself. He's like, no, just because I thought it'd be nice if he drove you. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. Angelo is getting blackout drunk <laughs> and harassing yes. her friends yes. at their house at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And betting everywhere he goes. He's drinking and betting and everywhere he goes. By the way, I feel bad for Bob, uh, her roommate's boyfriend. Poor guy. <laughs> Girlfriend's He's out of town. someone <laughs> lies in town t- in San Francisco. <laughs> and I yeah, know where's Angelo Bob? never tells him. Angelo's a terrible friend to Bob. Never says <laughs> anything. <laughs> Rico's played by Stephen Vincent Lay. Stephen Vincent Lay was in 25 episodes of a soap opera called Sunset Beach in 1997. Uh, he also popped up in a couple one-episode guest appearances in Nash Bridges and Deep Space Nine, Nash as well Bridges. as a. Uh huh. I saw throwing it out there. As well as a couple PM Entertainment style movies Midnight <laughs> Man in 95, Death Match in 94, and guys, Ring of Fire in 1991. <laughs> I have a feeling helped him get this role. Side note Stephen Vincent Lay had a trainer with him when they started filming this movie. Jeff Wincott saw them working out. And stepped up his game, started working out harder, in which Stephen Vincent Lee saw that and stepped up his game. Which is why, at the beginning of the movie, Jeff Wincott has a little bit of a beard cut. 
But by the end of the movie, both guys look like they're bodybuilders. So because apparently they got into a little bit of a competition with each other while they were filming. That's probably the best thing that came out of this movie is that they both got into real good shape. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> that must have been one hell of a trainer. Love to get that guy's number. So just so we're clear here, Rico, solid guy, taking care of his people. Yes, he's a fighter. P- people get hurt from the fights. He has, but he has a great sponsor in <laughs> Otomix. <laughs> I mean, he just got him covered. Pants, shoes, uh-huh. the ring, everything. Otomix to the rescue. For the record, that is a real brand. We looked it up. They still sell like workout shoes, wrestling shoes, weight. It's mostly <laughs> like weight training stuff, like weight training no equipment. Way. So, you, hey, you want some weight training equipment? Otomix. To the- <laughs> <laughs> so from here on out, I'm just going to say that everything is brought to you by Otomix. Yeah, I mean, if maybe we can okay. get some money out of this Otomix <laughs> for yeah. all your training needs. <laughs> Give me a free pair of wrestling shoes. <laughs> but Rico, stand-up guy, seems like he's taking care of Isabella. Everything's fine, not hurting anyone. No. Everything's fine. Even his even his place of business is nicer because we see where he fights. And that it's this nice gym-looking kind of place, you know? And then we see where Wh- Angelo goes where to hang out at, like, it's this, like, Chinese food restaurant. Like, <laughs> like anything goes there like they're fighting with nunchucks and and like whatever they want even his place is a little nicer than the other places putting on the fights i have a question about that place that he goes to next year where he's gonna go earn some money back he goes there and he tells uh isabella's brother that this is a done deal so he's guaranteed to win if he goes to the dragon or something like that is is what what it's called yeah it <laughs> sounds like he does this all the time like it's a it's guaranteed so how often do they let him come in bet on himself <laughs> and just destroy everyone that <laughs> fights at that place that's why she doesn't want him there right away she's like why don't you go away haven't you done this enough already like i'm tired of you the girl who runs it she's like oh but he convinces See, her that, with his I charm <laughs> Yeah, I kind of got the feeling like they were buddies. Like, she was like his best friend. Rico, stand-up guy. Isabella, even though she didn't make the bet, she honored it. Willing to hold her ground. She right? dresses like a whore, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she yeah. understands how the game, so she, she goes with her man. Yeah. Meanwhile, Angelo, total degenerate. <laughs> and never changes through the rest of the movie. <laughs> no, he no. doesn't. And he's not, still yeah, gambling. Yeah, not even after his... Not even after his montage, epiphany montage. Like, he's still the same douchebag. <laughs> yeah. So, and he keeps gambling. So, like, we're talking about the dragon. We start getting these scenes where he goes down to the dragon, and he's drinking beer, and he's betting on the fights at the dragon. And so, we end up seeing, like, six fights at the dragon, none of them involving him. He's just a <laughs> spectator. And we're just watching it, at watching him bet on these fights. Do get to see him fight a few people but yeah at no point does he is he ever like the protagonist in this movie where it's like i'm rooting for him that the amount of time that he spends at that fight club or whatever it is like it is quality so just real fast to set up a couple scenes because i want to come back to that scene where there's like six fights in a row just a couple little things to mention he goes home he's super drunk he he has been up all night he falls asleep he sleeps all day and then his best friend i'm assuming this guy that we hadn't seen previously in the movie, and we won't see again That's for the best. rest he, of the he movie. He says it's his best friend. Comes in and says, hey, I heard you went, you lost to Rico, and you lost Isabella, and then you stumbled around the city all night drunk. And he's like, how the hell did you know about that? And he's like, it's practically everywhere. Like, I don't know how I can miss it. <laughs> so his best friend's name is Charlie, because of course that can't be Bill, because he's in San Francisco, and his girlfriend's banging some other dude. <laughs> um, but Charlie is played by Ray Boom Boom Mancini. And Ray Boom Boom Mancini's first acting credit is Mutants in Paradise, 1984. <laughs> okay, I'm writing that one down, Mutants in Paradise. <laughs> like, he was also in Time Bomb in 1981, ni- 1991, movie called Bullet, 1996, with Mickey Rourke and Adrian Brody. And two pox to core. <laughs> what? Wait. <laughs> yes. That is a cast. Yes. And I've seen this movie. I've actually seen this movie Bullet before. This is, this is, it gets even crazier. This movie is about a Jewish junkie per, who's paroled back to a life on the, of crime on the streets. I know so. exactly what I'm doing next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but yes, Mickey Rourke, Adrian Brody, and Tupac were all in the movie together. <laughs> 
with Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Most people know Ray Mancini from that amazingly headlined fight where uh, someone died in the ring. He fought uh, against oh. him in until he died in the ring. And that's a really famous fight because it was heavily watched. And he was a last minute replacement. The guy fought really hard, but then he he died in the ring basically during that fight. Um, I remember Ray Boom Boom Mancini because he is an amazing boxer. And you want to talk about great fights, which don't happen anymore. If you still watch boxing, you don't see fights like what Ray Boom Boom Mancini put on. He stood toe to toe and was willing to stand, even as a small guy willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and just exchange with someone and whoever lands the most punches wins that was kind of his style and i love ray mancini yeah. for that so if there was someone that was going to clean up angelo i trust ray boom boom mancini and unfortunately he's not the iced tea to pookie relationship <laughs> that angelo really needed because he's Charlie's just going to disappear for the rest of the movie. And it's probably because Ray walked on set, did his scene. and was like, man, I'm not sticking around for this. <laughs> then after talking to his best friend and smelling his girlfriend's clothes. Yeah, like, that, that was, was really like, weird. Was, was weird. <laughs> he then goes to see his actual bookie then. And Angelo, what I can appreciate about Angelo is that he does got balls. <laughs> so remember, he goes to Rico and says, I'm going to gamble. I win. Okay, now I'll do two to one and bet my girlfriend loses. Asks for a loan from his now ex-girlfriend's brother so he can go fight two people at a different ring. That way he could take that money to go ga go do a <laughs> go gamble it on a college basketball game. Meanwhile, when he goes to see his bookie, he just turns his pockets inside out and says, "Sorry, boss, I don't got it." Yeah, and his bookie's kind of weird because, like, normally his bookie doesn't treat him like you would expect him to be, treat him. Normally, you know, you don't got my money, I'll break your legs. But I have a feeling like the bookie like anticipated him being like that and has been trying to turn him into like an enforcer because he basically just forces him into a job working for him. Yeah, he I, he's got the best bookie in all of Vegas. Like, yeah, it's cool. Like, you yeah. continue to owe me money. And, you know, if you don't have the money, you could just work it off. It's cool. He's got like a soft spot mm -hmm. for him. He says he's like, I got a soft spot for you because he's a fighter. But then he also says some pretty bad stuff about fighters. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the Greek is played by Michael Delano. He was most notably Forrestal in Commando. Mm, yes. So he was also the casino manager in both Ocean's Eleven and Twelve. Uh, mm. Notes hmm. would be the George Clooney remake. I have to admit, I haven't seen those movies. Yeah, we're not going to either. <laughs> <laughs> not missing much. Not missing much. <laughs> But we have seen Deadly Bet, so what does that say about us? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the Rick and Morty episode uh, about heists movies? Yes. Yeah, you've seen Ocean's Eleven. Then. <laughs> so now we're going to get to the scene that I love. I absolutely adore this scene. Angelo's got his money. He's going to go bet on this college basketball game. But he's going to do it while sitting at the Dragon. Yes. Where there's going to be fights. He's going to sit there and just listen to the game. And the movie... It does it needed like a 30 minute filler because that's how long this scene <laughs> takes. It is seriously like 30 <laughs> minutes. Yes. There are three different fights that take place. None of them involve any of the characters that we've met so far in the movie. Yes. They are just random people that are fighting, including some nunchucks and some other stuff. There's just some other and they're great fights for, for what they yeah. are. They're really great fights. But the whole scene is just Angelo listening to the basketball game as the team yeah. that he bet on slowly collapses and loses to a last second buzzer shot. Yeah, he's not paying any attention to what's going on in the ring. He's not paying, he has nothing, in no way does this further the plot at all. But the nunchuck guys are pretty cool. And I think <laughs> sure he, the, the nunchuck guy killed the other guy and like snapped his neck with him, which that was pretty cool. I don't know what to, I, I think that would affect their health rating. I wrote down, we're watching highlight reels at this point. And in a weird way, these fight scenes in Deadly Bet are better than fight scenes in the other movies that we've watched. <laughs> <laughs> With characters yeah. that will never come up again in the movie. They're just these random fighters yep. that happen. And it's supposed yeah. to be this high tension scene of him listening to the game and his team slowly collapsing. He's going to lose all of his money. 
But you don't even know what happens in the game because you're so busy watching the fights. Yeah, because you don't care about Angelo. Let's just admit it. No one cares about what happens <laughs> uh-huh. to Angelo. I want to know who the nunchuck guy that was that died. <laughs> yeah. Does he oh, have a and family? I, went, I, looked through, I looked through the cast. There were like 30 fighters, like people just listed as fighters in the cast. <laughs> like there were more fighters in the cast than actors. <laughs> By the end, I started to think that maybe the dragon isn't a Chinese buffet. Maybe it's a karate medieval times. Like, <gasps> oh, better. Yeah. You go Ooh. get food and then you like sit in your side because the crowd's really into it. Yeah. They're loving these fights. Angelo doesn't know what he's missing here because he's still locked into his basketball game. <laughs> but maybe I won't say that they're teams and they're like in the in the stands training like black and white, black and white. <laughs> and it's like karate and then they come out and they put on a show and stuff. I mean, anyways, I'm just pitching a business idea if anyone's got some <laughs> investors out there. <laughs> all right. So long story short, the basketball, he loses all of his bets. He loses the basketball game because, I mean, who bets on Rutgers? <laughs> it's, he's a terrible gambler. In fact, when he meets with the Greek, his his bookie, he even tells him that. He's like, you're, you're, you're a terrible gambler. Why are you going to keep doing this to yourself? He leaves the dragon, and he's all angry, and he busts up his radio. Ends up getting into a fight with a bunch of street thugs. And it's almost, like, therapeutic for him. He almost <laughs> needed that fight to kind of just get everything off. You almost feel bad for the street thugs. Like, man, they have no idea who they're picking a fight with right now. This guy's <laughs> in the hole for, like, 20 grand. <laughs> You've run up against a very, very desperate and drunk man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and even if you were to win this fight, there is nothing of value on him. Now, Angelo's doomed. Isabel is gone. He owes money to Rico. He owes money. I'm oh, sorry. He lost all his money to Rico. He owes Angelo's brother money. He owes the dragon I'm sorry, his bookie money. I'm all over the place here. He basically <laughs> owes everyone money all over town. He's a degenerate. He's an alcoholic. He's got a little bit of a gut, so he's getting out of shape. He may not be able to fight and win some money at the Dragon anymore. His bookie comes to him and says, all right, fine. You're going to go work this off. You're going to work a day with my other bodyguard or goon. Go collect money. Mm -hmm. And Angelo's not even good at that because the goon, who's got to be Italian, five foot six, 320 pounds. (laughs) He's built like the getaway driver in Snatch. (laughs) Yes. He, it looks like he gets tired just standing up. And yet somehow, like, he's still got to, like, babysit him through the whole time. And so now he's working, collecting money. Meanwhile, his girlfriend's know. getting her hair did. Which, by the way, before he goes and sees her at the salon, he takes a phone call at the house. And it's her hairdresser pushing back her, her appointment to noon. And he never gives her that message. So how is she getting her hair did? Didn't her appointment get moved? <laughs> I thought that too. I was like, oh, so they worked out the appointment thing apparently because he shows up and she's yeah. already there getting her hair dyed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Clearly he didn't tell her that it was moved. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> John's worried about that sorry, hairstylist schedule. That's what schedule. bugged me in that scene. Yeah. Angelo makes his pitch to, to Isabella in that scene and she looks worried and torn, but I'm thinking all the time like Rico's a better catch. You doing good, girl. Like, yeah. Just stick just stick with your man. And even his pitches, he's kind of a dick in his pitch, too, because he's kind of <laughs> like, well, I don't care about the three years we've been together. Just don't just don't be with this guy. You know, it's like, well, who cares? He treats her nice. He's got a nice <laughs> house in Henderson. You, you got some rental in downtown. Like <laughs> The only thing that's working out for Angelo is that he goes to dinner with the goon, and the goon probably took him to a pretty decent Italian place. Like it was, that was probably <laughs> the best meal that he's had in quite a while. The he goon complains knows about how it the whole time. Though, yeah. that's why. <laughs> he knows good food. <laughs> he's going to the place, the, the Italian place, with the salad. They put the slices of salami on top. <laughs> <laughs> you guys joke, but that's literally what I had for dinner. I made myself a salad with salami and cut up uh, hard boiled eggs in it. And I even put a little bit of pepperoni in there. We also have a moment where Isabella had gone out and then she comes back and Rico comes out and asks, where have you been? And she says, I'm going to go do whatever. Or, where, where, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to go do whatever I want to just so I know that I can. And I got this sense of like Isabella is working Rico as much as Rico is working Isabella. She's a real pro too. Oh, she yeah. knows what she's doing. Yeah, because he said, oh, yeah. oh you want to go right now? And she's like, oh, no, I don't want to go. I just wanted to know that I could go. 
but I don't oh. actually want to go because you're paying for everything. So I'm good right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the next time we see him, he's got that gift, that super expensive necklace. Like he just cashed in, like, like, like he just took out a mortgage on the gym to buy her a necklace. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to read what I wrote down from my notes here. Angelo meets up with Frank, who looks like he also sells a wicked seasoning salt. <laughs> 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 Isabella's brother. Angelo owes everyone money. He's still a dirtbag. And he tells Frank, I know I'm a degenerate. He's like, it's because you are, Angelo. You are. And there's nothing changing yeah, that. I wonder if he told his brother that he fed his sister there is something that i forgot to mention in the beginning and it's ha it happens in this scene with frank again and the next scene when angelo again stumbles over the doors clearly as you mentioned in our pre-show john there was some script issues and that was very clear because there's scenes like this doris scene where he goes over there drunk again where these these big gaps in between when someone stops talking and when the next person starts talking as if mm -hmm. they forgot their lines and someone is yelling it from the side like angelo says <laughs> let me come in please <laughs> and that is true because the actually the last about 20 to 40 minutes of the film script was just one line he goes to big tournament and wins that's it <laughs> there were no dialogue written or anything now, I'm not sure what point we go from scripted lines to just, hey, we just got to wing it, guys, and just try to close <laughs> this thing out. But at a certain point, yeah, they're pretty much just trying to come up with stuff on their own as they're filming it. So, and it becomes apparent, I would say, right about the montage, it becomes really <laughs> apparent that there's no longer a script for this movie. <laughs> we have gone, everything has gone out the window at this point. <laughs> I think it's right after this scene because there's this scene where Angelo drives up to Suicide Ridge, which is really hard to find in Vegas because it's in the desert and there's not like a lot of hills. <laughs> not a lot of riches. There. Yeah, there's not a lot of riches. And it's Vegas, so there's always a line. Like lots of people have made <laughs> terrible mistakes while they're uh -huh. in Vegas. So he decides not to wait yeah. in the line. He's just going to walk home I from guess. Suicide so, Ridge. Yeah, which is weird considering he drove drunk there. <laughs> um, it's okay then not to focus too much on the on the roommate but is bob back or is he not back yet did he find out about her banging i think, I think bob's gone why did he go see <laughs> is he friends with her is that why he went and saw her um is he trying to bang her too is that I what's that going too. on poor bob man jeez <laughs> she just he walks all the way home i don't know why he puts his car up on the ridge like that he just does that it's, it's, I don't know. He just does that. Maybe that's not his car. Maybe that's Isabella's it's car. It's just the thing that happened. Walks all the way home and he sees himself in the mirror. <laughs> and he's like, have I become the whoring, gambling, asshole, drunk that everyone degenerate? says I am? Cause, yeah, literally, they're like, you're a degenerate. He's like, I am? <laughs> so guys, of course, all it takes to get over a crippling gambling and alcoholic addiction is a montage to a ripoff of a James Taylor song. <laughs> and doing a couple laps around the park. And guys, it'll be bright as rain. I have a question, though. Do people really seriously exercise down the strip? Because he's like running past the casinos. Is that something people do in Vegas? They're like, I gotta go for a jog. Jog down the strip. <laughs> Seems really weird to me. You come back with so many porn and strip yeah, club exactly. business cards because <laughs> yes. you're trying to run but they're like slapping them on yeah. their hands when you're trying to go by and you can't like uh -huh. you see them and you you guys you make eye contact and they're holding it out and you feel like you have to take it how many pictures do they take with optimus prime and bumblebee <laughs> down those streets <laughs> running yeah next thing you know you you're in a live <laughs> studio audience <laughs> yeah <laughs> also most pointed this out when we watched it but it's the homeless guy singing the James Taylor ripoff song. Also, the same actor that plays Frank. I think it is. Just, just in a poncho. Because <laughs> he's got the same beard. I look. And it, they it didn't, probably they didn't name is, him. What so. bugged me about the song is that there is actually no name or record of these songs. Like no song was ever actually released. I can't. Well, thank find God. It. <laughs> In any form, I don't know if he was actually singing it or if it was the guy I'm going to talk about in music that was singing it or how it all came up. There's no backstory to it. Just some, we just get about 30 seconds of the middle of a fake song in a montage. It sounded like Milhouse's dad's music. 
Can I borrow I have, a feeling? That was in my head. Can I borrow a feeling? <laughs> <laughs> that was Milhouse's dad montage. He loses his wife, Luann. <laughs> <laughs> He gets kicked out. He has to live in that single apartment. <laughs> the cracker factory doesn't work out. He's also a drunk. So <laughs> Kurt. we we end up going through this whole montage and we get we never get confirmation on how much time has actually passed. Has it been a day, a month, a week? All we know is by the end of it, He's dressing better. He he's he's done with all of his alcoholism. But apparently, like the whole time, he's still working for his bookie, beating people up and taking their cars and stuff. After the goon shoots and kills someone, that's when he decides he's had enough. He's just gonna move to Colorado without Isabella. And this is when it's really, really clear that there is no script because the story stops yes. making sense. Yeah. <laughs> He packs up his stuff. Yes. That's clearly not the house he was staying at. No. It's some other house. It's some other house. Packs it up. And he's like, I'm going to drive out of town. He's telling her brother, I'm going to leave. I gave up on her. I got to start a new life. And he's like, that's a good idea. You know, whatever. But I'm going to stop by my bookie on the way. <laughs> yes. Well, first I got to make leaving. a bet. <laughs> See, I think he's probably been trying to move to Colorado for like six years. And he's just been doing this like every six months. So then, of course, the bookie is like, oh, man, I really hate to see you go. But best of luck. Uh, also, by the way, there's this huge <laughs> tournament being put on by Rico. I will pay you yes. $100,000 if you win it. But if you lose it, I'm going to kill you. And Angelo, being the degenerate gambler, is like, I'm listening. And then the bookie says, the Greek says, the main pot is $250,000. But I'm only going to pay you $100,000. Because he still owes him money. No, no. The the purse is Five, you can walk away with up to five, half a million, five hundred. Oh, okay, yeah. But and then he only says, get "I want two fifty. He's like, "No, I'm gonna give you two fifty. You'll take a hundred k, and you'll like it." <laughs> He's got a lot of. He has a lot of uh, hope put into Angelo that he can beat fifty guys, fifty or whatever, forty nine other guys. He couldn't beat Rico, and he couldn't stay in the ring for ten minutes. How did he have faith yes. that he was going to beat these other forty nine random guys that were kickboxers? <laughs> Just a reminder on the history of this, of this movie so far. Angelo keeps getting his face caved in yes. everywhere he goes around. Like <laughs> he loses everything. <laughs> One day, it, he wakes up and says, I don't want to be this degenerate anymore. I'm going to get clean. He runs the strip one time. <laughs> he packs up his stuff and then says, you know, I can win this tournament. And suddenly... Goes to fight in this tournament. Brought to you by Odomix, by the way. Odomix, all your wrestling needs. <laughs> so, and this is what's even worse, okay? So now they've got to try and figure out a way to close off all these storylines. So somehow it ends up with him, I guess, with the girl, winning the girl back. So now we've got to make Rico, who we all like at this point, <laughs> a bad guy. So now they make up this ridiculous robbery scheme where Rico is going to rob his own tournament. <laughs> Again, Put on. Script doesn't exist anymore. You can nope. tell it doesn't exist. Which is like, yeah, why? Why would he rob his own tournament? Why would he even be worried about fighting Angelo, who he beat his ass the first time? With the end of the tournament, I, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. Even in the production meeting with no script, like this didn't make any sense. <laughs> They, like, just think about all the stuff that's happening here. It's like this confluence of stuff that's all coming together. Suddenly, Angelo is really good at fighting. I mean, he kind of hints at through the movie that he's really good if he just got cleaned up. Yeah, because he wasn't sober. Mm -hmm. Now that he's sober, he's good. Yeah. Rico, not a bad guy, but he's going to rob his own tournament. And the Greek, who wants him to win so that he could pay him back and then Angelo can finally leave, says... Angelo says, I'm concerned about that Rico will kill me. After I win, his goons are going to kill me. And the Greek says, don't worry, I got you. I will protect you. And then you find out he's got just the one goon. Yeah, why was it just him? <laughs> like, Doesn't he have like a whole well, team of goons that work for him? Technically, Angelo is the other goon. <laughs> so <laughs> There was only two. One is dead now. In like very quick fashion, Wait. he dies too. <laughs> So, of course, so, in, the, in the final fight, 
brought to you by Odermix. It's Rico versus <laughs> Angelo. And it goes back and forth. It looks like in the beginning, Angelo's going to lose. He makes a comeback after he sees Isabella. Then the raid starts while the fight is ending. Guns come in. Rico almost gets a gun to shoot Angelo himself, but Angela, uh, Isabella, Isabella saves Angelo by bashing Rico in the head with a champagne bottle, which to break a champagne bottle on someone's head, that's kind of some force. You better watch out for Isabella. <laughs> she will destroy you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, give me back that necklace. <laughs> Gee, women. So I, I want to, I want to say something. When I watched this, I was really because like everything kind of went off the rails with the whole robbery scheme. I was like, it would be so much better. I was thinking it would be so much better if they just ended the movie like freeze frame Rocky style, like first punch. <laughs> they both, and then they freeze frame it. That's it. We don't get to see the robbery or nothing. Like that would have been awesome. But instead, we got to see the whole fight. We got to see Rico lose and. Angela gets the girl, and then the end of the last scene is them in some campground in in Colorado, and it just does not seem like their relationship is going all that well. Like, she doesn't seem very happy on the balcony in that (laughs) scene. And she comes running out, chasing away the neighbors because they're gambling, and he's like, oh, we're just gambling for, like, you know, matchsticks or something. Yeah, like, I, I did not get the feeling that they were in love, you know? <laughs> she came running out with a shotgun or a rifle or something yeah. to shoot off the neighbors. She's with, she's missing Rico. She could be in a hot tub, <laughs> getting her hair done, wearing all her leopard print stuff. <laughs> now she's stuck That's in some saying. stupid cabin with Angelo playing go fish. <laughs> yeah, this she doesn't end up. here. This this ends with a divorce five years down the line. And next thing you know, she's talking online to Rico. Um, <laughs> and that's the end of Deadly Bet. Thank God. <laughs> As you mentioned in the pre-show, and we've talked about through this, is that the last 20 minutes or so didn't have an actual script. And then when we started to work out all of the things that happened in the last 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you could really tell. It does not have a script <laughs> None of this stuff makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. Oh. It's, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's bad. It's borderline so bad it's good because you just have such a good time laughing at how bad things get by the end the only thing that, you know, that ruins think, it is that angelo is such a degenerate he's you such never a scumbag like you never like him the entire movie they spent so much time making him into a degenerate gambler and drunk that they never did any work to try and redeem him and then like <laughs> by the time that by the time they did they'd run out of script and they're like, like, they didn't know how to do it to bring it back. You know, and it's the same thing with Rico. Every scene where he could possibly turn around and be a, a kind of a dick to Isabella, he would end up looking like a nice guy. And like, by the time they got to the end of the movie, like, oh, we should have made him look like a dick one of these times. Because now it's not going to make any sense when she goes back to Angelo. And so it's like, it's like they totally mismanaged the first hour of the movie. And then the last half hour, they didn't have a script for him. They were like totally screwed because the, like they had to turn something in. PM Entertainment <laughs> has to start printing VHSs. <laughs> you know? Before we get too deep into our final thoughts, let's go take a look at this week's music. Now, I have a feeling the music is going to be similar to the movie, which is we went into it with a little bit of hype. And it's full of a lot of disappointment. <laughs> so let's go take a look at the music. All right, John. Music for this movie, I have low expectations. I had low with Roger Corman in the last movie. However, I have lower expectations for this one, <laughs> considering how things have gone. What do you got for us this week? All right. So the score was done by Louis February. He is a Mexican born composer. He was born in Saltillo, Mexico, and he actually composed his first works on the piano at about eight years old. And so, like, real piano progeny, his fam- family actually moved from Mexico to LA later so that he could study under Robert Turner. He would eventually find his way into the entertainment business, first being employed by the notorious B movie label PM Entertainment, which is Deadly Pet, who made Deadly Pet. So, like, 
PM Entertainment is the direct-to-movie. Most of the movies that we have been talking about this season are PM Entertainment movies. They did Deadly Bet. They did Ring of Fire. They did all of these direct-to-movie, uh, to video ones. The amazing thing about the movie Deadly Bet is that is that this guy, Louis February, who did the score, he actually came out of PM Entertainment and probably became the most successful of all of the people involved in the movie Deadly Bet. So a few <laughs> years uh, after working at PM Entertainment, he would meet his mentor, John Debney, and that partnership would produce a score for the movie Doctor Who, which is like the original Doctor Who movie uh, when they rebooted the Doctor Who series. And then he would also do his first TV series, the Cape, which he would win an Emmy for Best Dramatic Underscore. He would see continued success with movies as well as doing a number of Disney projects. He would do the movie Swim Fan, Tower of Terror, and a series of straight-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movies, including <laughs> Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders, which would receive an Annie Award nomination. Guys, Scooby-Doo directed movies, by the way, like, Scooby-Doo is, like, Simpson-level, like, <laughs> like, like like Simpsons have done it. Like Scooby Doo has done it. They've done <laughs> Scooby Doo and the Globe Trot and the Harlem Globe Trotters. Scooby Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. Scooby Doo and <laughs> Alien Invaders. Scooby Doo and Bill from the Corner. Um, <laughs> who hasn't Scooby Doo done a mystery with? With why am I not in a Scooby Doo movie at this point? There are more. There are probably half a dozen Scooby Doo and Kiss movies. I I, I, I just. All right, so he did some score work for them. He also won a Pixie Award for an indie short film called Revenge of the Red Balloon, which actually mm. sounds really good. I actually want to kind of check that out. Other projects he's done, he did score work for Desperate Housewives, Jimmy Neutron, Cats and Dogs, Chicken Little. He's most known for doing most of the score work for the uh, TV show Smallville, as well as Once Upon a Time in Wonderland. Um, so this guy, this guy has got he is hands down the biggest deal in this movie when you combine mm -hmm. everyone else together like there's nothing even close and he got and he probably got paid the least god knows he was probably scoring like 30 movies a week so he probably <laughs> got paid 400 bucks to do this movie you know um <laughs> by the way if you are interested in listening to the actual his actual collection of score and music go to lewisfebri.com <laughs> um at the bottom of the page He's got it all right there in like a playlist. Like you don't even need a special driver or anything. You just play it. You just listen to it. <laughs> um, so. This guy is so accomplished. How did, how did they ever get him? They, it, it must have been through some sort of sextortion. Or something. <laughs> no, maybe, I, maybe he had a gambling problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I'm convinced PM Entertainment was like his first ever job in the industry. He was some intern and he's doing like scores for PM Entertainment on the side, you know? So like, mm -hmm. like literally like him in a small, uh, in like a small studio with like a violin and a cello, just kind of <laughs> making shit happen. <laughs> He's, he's like one of those guys with the trash cans for drums, the tra trash cans and buckets on the street corner <laughs> yeah. of San Francisco. But yes. he's like actually recording it. Yeah. And look what I got him, man. I got him a whole series of Scooby-Doo movies and like working for Disney. <laughs> Tell you people, man, hustle. Uh, get out there and hustle. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Who cares? If you got a score of porn, score of porn. It'll get you a job somewhere. <laughs> he says no, but the whole world says yes. He yeah, did. that's what they were. We yes. all know. <laughs> <laughs> we all know. So again, check out lewisfebri.com and you can listen to his score music, um, <laughs> including the stuff he made for Scooby-Doo for and the Alien Invaders. <laughs> it's got an any nomination. Without fail. Music always over delivers. Always. It always <laughs> over delivers. You know why this movie failed? It's because this guy held all the talent. He just soaked like Infinity <laughs> Stone style. Sucked, sucked all, all the talent out of everyone else associated with this movie. Dude, and I almost went back to his website to try it, it back to that playlist on his website to find that James Taylor song from this movie. <laughs> so, oh, because I was so curious. I was like, well, who the hell sang the song then? Did he sing it to his wife? His wife is a music teacher, by the way. Um, mm. I found them both on social media. Um, <laughs> people, people, lock your social media. People like me will find you. 
I don't care if you have 100 followers. I will find you. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie and move past Deadly Bet to get ready for our next movie, which I am really excited for. So let's get Deadly <laughs> Bet done. <laughs> I'm going to kick off here on the final thoughts because I think I'm going to be the most favorable uh, out of the three of us. And that's not saying much because this is, this is a bad movie. And the reason why it's out of print is for a good reason. This is not a good movie. And the storyline makes absolutely zero sense. The two most exciting things that happen in this movie one, how Isabella gets treated, and you're like, oh man, she's gonna get really taken advantage of when she goes to Rico's, but he ends up taking great care of her. <laughs> <laughs> and two, the the two minutes and 37 seconds that Ray Boom Boom Mancini's on screen. End of good stuff that happens in this movie. But I can't imagine a karate movie about Vegas going any other way other than the main character is a loser, degenerate gambler who is addicted to the city itself because of all the stuff mm -hmm. that is there. And by the end, he really hasn't learned his lesson. And he's one airplane trip away from being a collect call from prison back to Isabella to get bail money out of the jail that's underneath the Luxor or some shit. <laughs> like, it is what I think of when it comes, if I also think of a karate person from Vegas, because I just, even though we live close to Vegas and we even have some family in Vegas, I just instantly think that everyone that lives in the area is like Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Can't imagine this movie going any other way and anyone being actually likable in this movie because it's in Vegas. And in that way, I wasn't let down. So this movie <laughs> wasn't a letdown for me. It delivered on what it promised. And I got what I wanted, which is great. And I loved it. And I laughed through it. And I had a lot of fun. And I'm never going to watch it again. <laughs> and I'm never going to talk about it again. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, I'm not going to be as hard as you thought I was going to be on it. <laughs> I mean, we all agree Angelo is a jerk face. Like, there's nothing redeeming about yeah. him. And even in the end, you're like, oh, great, you won. Fancy, that's good for you. You're still going to lose all the money you won anyways. <laughs> I think the best part of, about it is the uh, the people, the other characters, like the bookie and, like, the other, like, side characters are actually way better than Angelo. Ian and Rico and all the people that make up, like, the ensemble that create it. And the other fighters, even though you don't know their names, you're like, oh, those guys are pretty good. So at least that part was entertaining. For fighting, it is a good movie for to watch, like, legit the most matches in one movie, probably. It's really jam-packed mm -hmm. of people and fights and stuff. I that I get. That time somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> when you don't have a script, you have to do something. <laughs> but I do not know how Jeff Wincott got work after that. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> and the music and every, just everything about it was very much like Skinamax. <laughs> sex movie you know the ones where they're like doing it but it's in the wrong spot and stuff. <laughs> you know what i'm talking about you can't Open figure it out yeah, yeah how is that working <laughs> anatomy wise that's not working it was it was like that it was like a low budget <laughs> karate no sex movie <laughs> <laughs> and in the end poor rico he didn't get anything <laughs> he got wanked on that one <laughs> john what are your final thoughts well i already kind of let a little bit out as far as what i thought with the movie that they took too long and they just ran out of script but beyond that i feel like as far as answering the question vegas versus the other cities i think dom you're right degenerate gambler should be the martial artist that represents vegas <laughs> i probably would have been happier if they had let rico win and isabella had stayed with rico angelo had just gone off and fallen back into being a drunk gambler Actually, yeah, like, that might have been better. Probably, that would have been the better ending. All of that aside, as far as the matches go, the matches were really good. The problem is, is that the main character wasn't involved with most of them. <laughs> and so based on the matches that we saw the main character fight, I would say there's no chance in the world he would ever beat L.A. or Seattle karate. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jeff. But if just... If you drank a few less beers, I might have a little bit more confidence in you. I mean, Seattle Karate beat John Claude Van Damme, and and then L.A. Karate. I mean that. I mean, and then Bloodsport. I mean, is Bloodsport? It's the Kumate. So, 
I, I I don't know. I mean, I feel like I feel like Vegas kind of kind of let me down. I also just I, one side note: it's funny that Vegas is now the capital of like mixed martial art. You know, like I feel like everyone in Vegas is a mixed martial artist now. Almost nowadays, Vegas it I I could see like every place having a fight in the middle of the restaurant nowadays, <laughs> you know? So, like, maybe this movie was ahead of its time. Maybe this is foreshadowing to what Vegas is going to look like in 10 years, because apparently the UFC is the only sporting event left. John, I think you and I are in agreement here that the problem here is that it's actually Vegas. And the city of Vegas, what it always turns out is what feels like the Big Lots version of other things, <laughs> right? You know what? Yes. Like, it's a shadier parking lot. Some cars get broken into. It's a knockoff of a knockoff version of the thing in the store, but you got it for really cheap. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about this movie, what you think about Jeff Wincott. How do you think Jeff Wincott holds up against Frank Dukes? Because they're both Canadian. And Wincott seems like he might be a legit dude. Like, the fighting style that you see is what you get. Or Frank Dukes might be the bigger liar. <laughs> 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 so, he would love to hear from you about Canadian martial arts, too. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, and ways you can send us money just saying like you got any money like, yeah send, send it send to us, us. Money. Hey, <laughs> one of us is, one of us on this call is out of work <laughs> we would appreciate it if you would go to there like you can see our square cash or venmo like you, you just want to venmo us like 20 bucks like i'm not saying i'd say no to that money right <laughs> <laughs> Go to that website to find also, all of that information. Also, go go on Twitter and follow Louis February. He's only got about 800 followers, and he could probably use a, 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 a few followers. He seems like a nice guy. Like, he's got yeah. some pictures. Like, he seems like the type of guy he'd take you in the studio, you know, <laughs> show you how to do scoring. He's got some pictures of, of a few uh, people he took under his wing on LouisFebury.com. So I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Just give him a follow. You know, he's go got show him some love. Give him some love. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Go show him the go with the heat love. Go follow that man. We would also appreciate it if you went to your podcast or platform of choice, preferably iTunes. You listen to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever the hell they're calling it now. Go over to Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. Go ahead. Just give us five stars. No one is going to know that I told you to go there to give us five stars. And then in the review, don't need to write a review about the actual show because no one ever reads those reviews. Instead, we want you to write a fictional story in which, in which Jeff Wincott and Frank Dukes fight each other and how that story <laughs> goes. Let us know how that story goes and leave that in, in your review at your podcast, your platform of choice. And then if enough of you follow Louis February, he might even write a score for it. <laughs> so that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.